Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the 59th episode, 59th episode of the Pen Podcast, Psychic Eye Mystery Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Laurie, with my fabulous sidekick, Sandy, my sister, uh, my sister, not from another, another mister, my actual sister. Um, see the resemblance? Uh, <laughs> you know, I was uh, telling some people the other day, I have a really good close group of friends I've become friendly with in the last year. And um, we all started talking about like our heritage, right? You know, our parents, grandparents, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, it was really lucky that my father married my mother because otherwise it would have been a real disaster. The ugliness, the ugly side of the, like our, well, my, our father was not an attractive man, Absolutely. right? And his, his mother was very homely. So they were, oh, all like, they were laughing at me. Like, how can that be? I'm like, I'm serious, you guys. She was homely on the outside and ugly oh, on the horrible. inside ugly yeah. on the inside and yeah, i said was, and they were like she was mean <laughs> she was mean she was mean so <laughs> jerry then, married what he knew yeah so then they, somebody said well how did you know how did she die i said she died at 72 and i said you know she got into an elevator at a assisted living facility put up her walker because she didn't want the doors closed fell backwards broke her hip and and she went down to hell and everybody's like yeah. oh my god i thought you meant she went down the <laughs> elevator shaft i'm like no down to hell <laughs> She's down it's horrible to laugh at yeah. that, but still. It's true. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> she was, so the story with, we, she insisted we call her Granny Uppy, and we all fucking hated that name. Like, absolutely hated it, right? And um, Granny Uppy, ugh. Um, and she was a raging alcoholic, like, had bad psoriasis, like, raging, raging, raging from, like, forever she had been an alcoholic. And um, so she wore the ring that Sumner, our grandfather, um, gave to her, which was not like a, a traditional wedding ring. It was actually gold with blue enamel squares. Hmm. And she wore that for her whole life, right? Because she never dated anyone else because who would date her? Anyway, um, huh. bless your heart. Granny Uppy, bless your heart. Um, I, I've never felt her in the ether ever, never. Uh, which I find interesting because I've felt Sumner, but I've never felt uh, Francis. Yeah, but she went by Liz, so go figure. That's right, Liz. Fran yeah, okay. Anyway, um, so the wedding ring comes home with us, and she and my mother hated each other because they were identical. Hell, you know? like, Yes, exactly. Right. Um, and she was the only woman, the only woman I ever saw Ruthie intimidated by. The only woman, um, because Liz had her number. So anyway, so the wedding ring comes home and it, it ends up downstairs on the ironing board in the basement, right? And the basement ironing board. And the energy around that ring was not, not nice. It really was not. I didn't like the basement anyway, but like, but the energy around that ring was not nice. So, um, I remember going down there and I knew I had to pass the the ring to get to uh, the washer or dryer or whatever, I, so probably something in the dryer. And like, I was plotting like, how fast could I get by it? And I started to go by it and the energy wasn't, there was no negative energy there. And I kind of looked over and the, the ring was gone. So uh, I got my stuff and I went upstairs and I asked Ruth, um, our mother, um, <laughs> I asked her, she's an awful person. She really is. She's just terrible, you know, brutal. Sandy, you know, she's awful. Um, anyway, very abusive woman, especially to me. Anyway, um, so I went upstairs and I asked her what happened to Granny Uppy's ring. And she's like, what do you mean what happened to it? It's on the ironing board. And I'm like, no, it's not. It was gone. Never to be seen again. Nope. Never to be seen again. So Liz came and stole it. And down, down. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, there is no hell. Yeah. Um, I get true. that a lot where people are like, you know, is, is so-and-so on the other side, are they in heaven? And yes, but there's no hell. There's no underlayer. What there, there's grounded spirits, ghosties, spooks, which is a good segue for my anecdote today. Um, there are grounded spirits, spooks, and then there is uh, where all of us eventually end up, um, which is the other side. There are places where <laughs> mean people go to work on their issues, right? Like 
hateful people who are free of usually the mental disease that shaped them into being horrible, mean, nasty, terrible people um, can work on the parts of their personality that weren't necessarily ruled by their mental illness, right? So being cruel is a choice. It's not a compulsion, it is a choice. There are plenty of psychopaths and sociopaths who are, who are terrific people, honestly. They really are. You know, your, your top surgeons usually are, are uh, psycho, uh, either psychopaths or socio, uh, yeah, sociopaths. I mean, they, they're competitive, they're narcissistic, they have a God complex, all of that. And they are dedicated to healing people, making people feel better, right? So being cruel, being mean, being evil, that is all a choice. And so uh, those people, when they cross over, they go to work on the fact that they chose to be a certain way. And that's where I think Liz has been this whole time. <laughs> yeah, I think she's been working on her issues this whole time. So interesting. All right. Anyway, so talk okay. about spirits. Talk about the yes. ground of spirits. Okay. So, um, so I, you'll notice my background is different. Um, I am staying with a dear friend of mine um, on the lake, uh, one of the Great Lakes, because I'm in Michigan, so on one of the Great uh, Great Lakes. And this house is very historic to the area. I think it was built. I think it was built in the early 1900s, and um, it's massive. Like it's they're like 13 bedrooms. Like it's huge. And um, my friend and her husband have done a phenomenal job, really phenomenal job, restoring it without making it, without um, removing the historic appeal of it. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just really beautiful, but it is haunted. So, uh, my friend and I, um, were upstairs moving mattresses around because we're trying to get, um, things in uh, all the mattresses in the right location, et cetera, et cetera. So we're moving lots of furniture around and <clears throat> we go by, this one particular room that every time I walk by it, I zip, zip, zip past it, right? Because it's haunted. And um, so it's her office. It's, I'll call her M. It's M's office. And um, she goes, uh, oh, is this the one that you think is haunted? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, I've never felt anything. And she's super intuitive, super, super sensitive to like, uh, especially to crystals and energy and all that stuff. She's really sensitive. And I'm like, how could you not feel this? So uh, we step into the doorway and there is pressure, like don't enter, right? Not, not malevolent, not evil, not anything, just pressure, right? And I'm like, you don't feel that? And she goes, oh my God. And I'm like, see? So it's this energy, right? Stay out. Basically, this is my space, stay out. And um, so what does Meg do? Well, now I've let it out of the bed, Meg. What does she do? She walks in and she goes, mwah, mwah, mwah. And the, that whole pressure went Phew, away. So it's just uh, Meg showing her a little bit of love. And it's a female spirit. I've always known it's a female spirit. And, um, you know, we're strangers in her house. And um, so every time a stranger would step into your doorway, it would alarm you and you'd be like, get out, right? Like stay away. So Meg showing her some love, I think really opened uh, the spirit up there to like, okay, that's okay, you can come on in. Um, so- Have you cha have you noticed a change in the energy since Meg and Meg did that? Well, I noticed immediate, but I haven't been in that room, back in that room since. So, um, uh, I might, I don't know, I'm here alone So I, today, so I don't know that I want to tempt fate, you know, like, remember me? Get out. Yeah, yeah no, um, you know, it says, get out, get out. So. Yeah. Sage. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Go to the light, Go to the light, you know, Let's do this, you know. <laughs> so anyway, um, so then I have a, another little anecdote because I, I don't have a book to promote today because I'm on I'm up here on vacation and I didn't bring anything up. So um, Meg and I, Meg is phenomenal at, at the pendulum. She um, can like she really makes that thing. Woo -woo. So explain so, what a so pendulum is, is. I am. So here is a pendulum. It's a little tiny one, but basically, you hold it over a little mat and then shut up and the mat. <laughs> Stop 
picking on me. And the mat has all sorts of, almost like a Ouija board, right? So it's got all sorts of, it's got yes, no, it's got letters on it. It's got uh, months of the year on it. It's got numbers. It's um, it's basically a souped up magic eight ball, you know, looking thing. So the idea is to simply hold the pendulum, right? As still as you can um, over the mat. And if it starts swinging, that's like your answer, right? So you can ask, ask it questions just like a, a Ouija board, right? If you do it right, you'll feel kind of energy coming down your arm into the pendulum and it will start moving with, and and I know this because I was do I, I've never done it before. I've never done the pendulum before, but I felt the energy and I went with it. I leaned into it and um, I was trying my hardest to hold it as still as possible. And it was swinging whoo, whoo, wildly, right? I could feel the energy right down to the pendulum. So it's pretty neat, you know, as a tool goes, it's pretty neat. So um, I'm like, I'm trying to test it. So I close my eyes, I spin the mat around and um, I ask in my mind, when is the optimal, optimal month to move to Minnesota? So I have two choices that I know I have two choices, November and April, right? And not trying to plan anything. I've spun the thing with my eyes closed, could not see it, right? And I can feel it. Um, Initially, it was going back and forth, and then all of a sudden, it changed directions dramatically and started to really swing side to side. And I'm like, "That's crazy!" Because I could feel it. I'm like, "That's crazy!" So I looked down, and it's the pendulum is swinging between November and April, which I thought was hilarious, right? So uh, those are the two months that I was trying to decide which to go. So Meg, uh, Meg was upstairs. She comes down. I explain. I'm like, "Look at this! This is crazy!" And um, there was a question that she had put to the pendulum that a member of her family was really counting on. And I intuitively had not felt that way. I'd felt another way. Um, and the news came back that I was right, which was very disappointing to the family member. Um, and Meg was like, I don't understand it because every single time I asked the pendulum, would this happen? It said, yes. And I said, well, here's the deal. That energy that's coming through your hand is actually channeled energy and it's channeled from the other side. So on the other side, <clears throat> it's my firm belief. I don't know this for sure, but it's my firm belief from everything that I've seen before we come down here, we map out our lives. And from what I've been shown, it looks like a cactus with a lot of arms. It actually doesn't look like a cactus. I, I want to, it looks like a blueprint of that you would see of like circuit a circuit, right? So there's a straight linear line that all of these little branches come off of and some like curve and some, some blend. So it almost looks like an engineer's gizmo thing, okay? Um, if I had to describe it naturally, it would look like a cactus with a, a thousand different arms. And the pathways off of the central line, which is your life, are all choices that you get to make. But the central line is like your life's purpose and kind of your destiny, okay? So the other side has access to that blueprint. And so when they're giving you information, they're looking at the blueprint and they're like, well, it looks like you're gonna make this choice and this door will open to you. So I had read for Meg's family member and I had said initially that this thing that she really wanted to have happen. I said, you have a very good shot at that happening. But I never said it would happen because at the time it felt 50-50. It really did feel 50-50, but she had a great shot at it. And then as we went closer to the news, um, I felt more and more like it wasn't going to happen. And um, it was heartbreaking to this uh, family member. So unfortunately, um, so I, I was explaining to Meg, I said, the other side has access to that library, or excuse me, that blueprint. Everybody's blueprint, they have access to it. They can see pathways that um, you planted in your life to be open. So this family member had the opportunity, she wrote in the opportunity to have this thing happen, but it, it was only one choice off of, off of that. There were other choices that could be made, but that's the one that she really 
was counting on and wanted to have happen. There's nothing about her energy or her destiny that has changed. And that's important because even if you feel that this one thing that must happen or else your entire future is ruined, that is not how that works at all. So the other side has access to that library. They can see what you want to have happen and they can see that it's an option. And so they usually hate to pass on bad news or, or you know, disappointing news. So they're always like, oh yeah, it's totally gonna happen. So when I do readings, often I'll get, you know, grandpa says you're, um, uh, grandpa says you're getting promoted, right? And I say it like that. Your grandfather says you're getting promoted. And then I say, I'll take a look because your energy is where the next choices that you will be making lie. So it's uh, not only your choices, but the consequences of other choices. So because this thing did not happen the way it needed to happen for Meg's family member, the door closed. So that opportunity, she had a great shot at having this happen. And then there were other decisions made that affected other variables that affected that doorway, right? Opening or closing and it closed, but her path forward remains unchanged. So she, even though this thing didn't happen that she was really hoping would, there's still other ways, you know, other choices that she's gonna make and the path forward, her ultimate destiny hasn't changed. She's going to be a very powerful person. Let's put it that way. She's going to be very powerful, mover and a shaker. That has never altered. Just something that she thought needed to happen in order to get that didn't. And, and that's not the case at all. So when I look, I'm looking at your energy. I'm looking at the front of your energy, which is where we carry um, the bits of our future that are about to happen. And usually we carry usually we carry about a year's worth. Sometimes we carry on one particular topic, we carry a lot more. So like someone can, can be destined, as an example, someone can be destined to be a judge someday. And um, uh, I had a point, someone can be destined to be a judge, but there are things in front of that thing that's gonna happen in a decade that are different than what we think are gonna happen, but still the destiny, the route there to judgeship remains firm. So other things get mixed up, other topics get, get mixed up, right? So we might only carry a year's worth of information about our relationships, or we might carry a year's worth of information about where we'll live. Um, but there are some things that we can carry as sort of a destined kind of thing that are cemented solid and it's not foggy, like you're wearing it in your energy, you're gonna be a judge, okay? So anyway, so I always look just to make sure that grandpa isn't like, I've seen this in your blueprint, it's totally gonna happen, you know? Um, just to make sure that the door is open or if it's closed that you have an alternate route. So I rely on your energy for accurate information. I rely on them to say, hi, kitten, how are you? I see you're in school, that's wonderful. I'm so proud of you and I love you. That's what I rely on them for. So, I, you know, it's interesting to me because we've had this conversation, Sans, because we know some phenomenally gifted mediums. And it's interesting how when they do these two that I'm thinking of, who, they're, they're amazing, they're incredible. Um, when they give information that, is forecasting um, how I always take it with a grain of salt because I know where they're getting their information. They're getting their information from your loved ones who want everything that you want to have happen in your life happen. They just want to see you happy. Um, yes, they want you to learn your lessons down here. That's why we're here. That's why we struggle. That's why we have pain. That's why we have adversity. That's why, um, uh, we have achievements and goals and things like that, right? Because this is all we're working on for our stay down here, this temporary stay down here. But the other side, your grandparents are always going to want you to have everything you wanted in your life happen for you, right? So their information isn't as accurate as what is already in your energy, I've noticed. So I always 
take it like grandpa says this, but I'm going to check. And sometimes I'm like, I disagree with grandpa. I'm sorry. So brace yourself, you know, brace yourself. Um, and when a psychic says to you, you have a good chance, what that means is, is that there's a lot of positives that could happen, but there's also opportunities for it not to happen. So I'm always very, very, very careful in my language when I when someone's counting on something, you know, like, I'm not gonna get that job. I'm always very careful in my language to say, it's looking really good right now because you could go in and blow the interview, right? And then it becomes my fault, right? So, um, so my advice is always, does the energy feel super positive? And it does um, to say, you've got a really great shot. I think that like you're in the top three for that, for that candidacy. So ace your interview because what you wear in your, in your energy and what they see is not always destiny. You can blow it. You can be like, I'm going to set this thing on fire. So, because you have free will. So free will can absolutely alter your path forward. So you have free will as an example, say you have in your destiny, I don't know, to become a professor. Okay. And in high school, you get introduced to drugs, you know, oxy, whatever, right? You get introduced to drugs and you become a drug addict and your life goes in a completely different direction. And you'll never end up being that professor, which is what you wrote in your blueprint because you had the choice to dabble in the drug. You had the choice to say no uh, the very first time. You had the choice to say no the very first time or to be like, yeah, I'll try it. And that led you down an alternate path. So, But you also, <clears throat> you also have to consider that there are other players here on this plane that are affecting sure. your sure. journey, right? So sure. I could go in and ace that interview, but there could be another candidate in there that they they click 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 with better. And therefore, even though I sure. should have gotten that job, the other person ends up taking it. Right. And you always have in your blueprint an alternate. So like you should have gotten the job, you didn't, but your your blueprint will provide a path that still leads you forward. That's so even that's setbacks, <laughs> yeah, no, even setbacks are not really setbacks. They're just delays. Yeah, I get that. So that's right. what I'm- So you want your plane, you want your plane to be on time in every city it's yeah. going to. Yeah. Sometimes there's a mechanical failure. Sometimes there's a people failure. Sometimes there's a weather failure, you know? Yeah. So it's still going to go there. It's just going to have some delays. That's all. So um, them's my anecdotes. Um, so that's kind of how I think it works. Do I know for sure 100%? No. But with all of the interactions that I do between the other side and all of the thousands of readings I've done at this point, um, it, it, I have enough sort of anecdotal evidence to say this is really how I think it it shakes out. I mean, we'll never know until we cross how it right. really works, but <clears throat> that's how I think it's, think it's working. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do something a little unique today in terms of the sharing of the case that we have. So um, we're focusing for the next couple of weeks on the uh, rich and famous. And this is a case that Victoria has been very interested in as have I been. Um, and so for years. Yeah. So Victoria has not had a lot of time to prepare because she's on vacation. So <laughs> I'm going to read the case. She'll be hearing parts of this case for the first time. And in order to sort of uh, offer up her, her insights into what she thinks may have happened, she's actually going to pull some cards as I'm reading the- And I'll show you. I'll show you what I get. Yeah. So tarot cards, um, let me just explain the difference between tarot, tarot card reading and a psychic reading. That's the explanation. That's the difference. <laughs> there's none. Okay. There's none. There's no difference between a tarot card reading and a psychic reading. Tarot cards are simply a tool that if, if we are tired um, or if you like to use them, you can use them. They don't have a magical power. Although sometimes you'll pull the magical card and you'll be like, oh my God, they're enchanted. They don't, they're paper. This is paper. There's no power in this paper, okay? I could set this on fire and no, nothing bad would happen to me, 
okay? Um, but they are imbued with certain images. And when you're doing it right, um, you kind of look at a picture. Okay, so like, this is the universe. I don't know what any of the car the traditional meanings of the cards mean. I've never learned. Um, so whatever. Huh? I what? said that's true. So it? so no, no. Oh, yeah. So I'm I'm very literal. I'd be looking up the exact definition of that card and then sticking with that definition. Whereas you're like, well, <laughs> today it feels like blah blah blah. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> if you want to use it as a guide, go for it. But like I look at a card like this and immediately I think of travel. Um, so Sandy's sitting in front of me and I pull this card and I think travel because oh. she's going to come visit me in three weeks. So, um, and we're going to do a podcast with the two of us where Sandy's going to cook in the kitchen. So stay tuned for what? Maverick <laughs> in the kitchen. Um, uh -oh. Yeah. Rot row. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. And I will be holding the fork. So okay. I will be ready. So this makes me think of travel. Um, just because like this makes me feel like the earth spinning, right? And uh, there's movement and um, I don't know, it just sparked the idea of travel. So that's really how they work. They just sort of spark an idea. And then you start talking about the topic and the information just kind of comes. So I've had a very intense couple of days. So normally I just kind of like eh, tune in and blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to use tarot today because I'm tired. And I've had clients already. I've got clients afterwards. So why should I work harder when I can work smarter? So that's the deal. Okay. So, so fire so, away, Sandy. All right. So our case today is focused on Ronnie Chasen, who was a high-powered Hollywood publicist that was... Um, assassinated while she was driving home from an event. So uh, on November 16, 2010, 64-year-old Hollywood publicist Ronnie Chasen was gunned down as she, as she was driving home from an after-party celebration at the W Hotel for the premiere of the film Burlesque, which starred Cher and Christina Aguilera. Ronnie represented burlesque producer Donald DeLine and songwriter Diane Warren, whose song You Haven't Seen the Last of Me was performed by Cher in the film. Ronnie was excited about the results of her efforts to work the room as it was crucial. It was a crucial period just before the Golden Globe ballots were to be sent out in early December. At about 12.28 a.m., as she arrived at the intersection of Sunset Boulevard and Whittier Drive, four shots were fired through Ronnie's front passenger car window. Moments later, her late model black Mercedes-Benz ran a curb, then hit and toppled a concrete streetlight. On-scene authorities found a mortally wounded Ronnie slumped in the driver's seat, and about 45 minutes later, she was pronounced dead at Cedar sinai Medical Center. On December 8, 2010, the Beverly Hills Police Department declared its preliminary conclusion that Ronnie's murder had been a random act of violence. A robbery attempt turned violent by a convicted felon named Harold Martin Smith, who committed suicide in front of officers as they approached him in his apartment building lobby for questioning. Police claimed that the ballistics matched the gun Smith used to kill himself to that of the weapon used to kill Ronnie Chasen. But is that really what happened? Many don't believe it to be true. And so let's hear the information. Ronnie Sue Chasen was born Veronica Cohen to a Jewish family in Kingstown, New York on October 17, 1946. She was raised in both the Riverdale neighborhood of the Bronx and the Washington Heights section of Manhattan. Following a brief marriage, she moved to Los Angeles in the 1970s, initially to pursue an acting career. She adopted a new last name, Chasen, as a nod to then Hollywood hotspot Chasen's and secured appearances on The Guiding Light and The Patty Duke Show. Ronnie began her early public relations career working for her brother, film director Larry Cohen, who hired her as a publicist for his 1973 Blackstopian film, Hell Up in Harlem. From there, she obtained a position at Rogers and Cohen, and then in 1993, became senior vice president for publicity at MGA, MGM UA. She then launched her boutique firm, Chasen & Co., which included a client mix of Hollywood producers, directors, composers, and songwriters. Her firm also specialized in handling Oscar campaigns for studios. At the time of her death, her clients had netted at least 150 nominations, and seven had won Best Picture, including Driving Miss Daisy, no Country for Old Men, Slumdog Millionaire, and The Hurt Locker. Ronnie's success with Oscar, Oscar campaigns was due in part to her relentlessness. The petite blonde was unafraid to speak her mind and was often unapologetically pushy. 
Whether over the phone or on the red carpet, her brazenness knew no bounds. Typically dressed in her trademark cream-colored Armani suits, Ronnie Chasen was someone who knew everyone and everyone knew her. However she conducted herself publicly, privately, she maintained an inner circle of nearly a dozen dear friends, mostly women who she had met through work, and dated a series of high-powered interesting men. Although she was Jewish, Ronnie liked to throw a Christmas party at her high-rise condo located on Wilshire Boulevard's condo corridor between Century City and Westwood. Her affinity for cream and white tones extended to her condo, condo decor, which was filled with all-white furniture, as well as fine art prints and flowering trees. Exactly what happened to Ronnie after she departed the burlesque launch party at the W Hotel for home in her black 2010 Mercedes-Benz E350 is unknown. What has been documented is that as Ronnie was driving towards her Westwood home less than 10 miles away, she made a call to her office at around 12.22 a.m. A few minutes later, at about 12.28 a.m., as Ronnie's car was heading west on Sunset Boulevard and slowed or stopped in the left-hand turn lane to turn south on Whittier Drive, four shots were fired through her car's front window, shattering, sorry, sorry, through her car's front passenger window, shattering the glass. Despite her dire injuries, Ronnie's vehicle glided a quarter of a mile down curving Whittier Drive before her Mercedes ran a curb and knocked over a concrete light pole, crushing the front end of her vehicle and deploying the driver's side airbag. 911 dispatch received several calls from neighbors near the intersection to report hearing gunshots. Shortly thereafter, callers alerted authorities about a black Mercedes that had collided into a concrete street lamp. Ironically, Ronnie's car had crashed into a crashed to a stop just yards from the living room of the Spanish mansion where Bugsy Siegel was executed in 1947, which happens to be the Beverly Hills Police Department's most infa infamous unsolved case. When police arrived, they found Ronnie slumped in the driver's seat, in and out of consciousness, with blood oozing from her nose and her chest area. Jefferson, Jefferson Airplane psychedelic rock White Rabbit was playing on the still-running Mercedes stereo. Ronnie's Prada purse sat on the passenger seat, and office paperwork was strewn about the passenger seat floor. According to the autopsy report, two bullets hit Ronnie's chest without causing immediate catastrophic damage. A third bullet hit her in the right upper arm, and the fourth shot, likely the most fa fatal, entered through her right shoulder and struck her heart. Unable to locate a pulse, Ronnie was transported to nearby Sin Cedar sinai Medical Center and pronounced dead at 1.12 a.m. No shell casings, live rounds, or weapon were recovered at the scene, and Beverly Hills Police Department was unable to determine if there had been another passenger in the car with Ronnie at the time of the shooting. Ronnie's violent death stunned her family, friends, and colleagues in the Hollywood community as nobody knew who had killed the high-powered publicist or why. Speculation quickly sparked conspiracy theories that ranged from murder for hire to rumored art deals, shady film finances, and family gambling debts. Even former LAPD chief William Bratton, then working in private security, speculated that it could have been a road rage incident or a random drive-by. Harold Matzner, chairman of the Palm Springs Film Festival and a longtime client of Ronnie's, announced a $100,000 reward for information about her murder. After a two-week search, Beverly Hills Police zeroed in on Harold Martin Smith, who was 46 at the time and a person of, as a person of interest in the case, after an anonymous tip made by Laramie Baquet was made to America's Most Wanted. Baquet and Smith resided a few doors from one another in a dingy 177-unit Harvey Apartments, a couple of blocks northeast of Paramount's Hollywood lot. McKay described Harold Smith as a polite and sensitive person, though Smith, who grew up in New York State, possessed a rap sheet for robbery and burglary and had spent almost two decades in prison. McKay contacted America's Most Wanted after growing suspicious of Smith, whom he claims knocked on his door 90 minutes after Ronnie's murder. According to McKay, Smith asked him, have the police been here? Has there been anything on the TV? And then we haven't had this conversation. McKay then said the next morning at 11 a.m., he's knocking at my door saying, do you have a dollar that I can borrow? I need to go get my bicycle. And I say, where is it? And he says, it's in Beverly Hills. I was at a loss for words. I knew what this was. Smith was evicted from the Harvey six days after Ronnie Chasen's murder for non-payment. McKay allowed Smith to store two boxes in a duffel bag at his place. And according to Bacay, Smith, who sporadically returned to the building in the following weeks, became super paranoid. He was losing it, losing it, he said. If I'm not back Thursday, take my things because I'll be resting in peace. At 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, December 1st, Beverly Hills police detectives intercepted Smith at, in the Harvey's small lobby. 
He allegedly responded by brandishing a stainless steel 38 caliber Smith and Wesson model 67 revolver in his right hand, which happened to have been reported stolen three years earlier. And he fatally shot himself in the right temple. No suicide note was found. Documents retrieved from his body's body indicate that Smith was looking for work and for housing. Upstairs in Bacay's apartment, Bacay recalls a Beverly Hills police detective laying Smith's belongings from his duffel bag and two boxes out on Bacay's bed. Bacay alleges that upon opening one of Smith's boxes, the detective discovered four empty shell casings. On December 8, 2010, Beverly Hills Police held a news conference and shared that they had received a preliminary ballistics report from the L.A. Sheriff's County Department Firearms Crime Lab that indicated that the gun Smith used to kill himself was the same one used to murder, murder Ronnie Chasen. Police said they believed that, the, that Smith acted alone and it, it was in no way connected with road rage, but instead likely a robbery gone wrong. This very certain position was taken even though the department had no known evidence that placed Smith at the murder scene or the robbery motive, and ballistics did not prove that Martin Smith shot Ronnie Chasen. Forensically, there was not enough comparison value to confirm that the bullets came from the same source. The Beverly Hills Police Department claimed without proof that Smith had made his way to Beverly Hills by bicycle the night of the killing and had acted alone in a robbery attempt gone wrong. However, police have not explained how Harold Smith, sorry, Martin Smith, could have returned to the Harvey apartment so quickly without his bicycle and why he left, why he left it in Beverly Hills in the first place. Further, the department did not dust Ronnie's car for fingerprints, nor at the time of their press conference had they reviewed Ronnie's bank statements, hard drive, or cell phone records. Police also neglected to interview Ronnie's friends and associates, some of whom were with her on the night of her murder. BHPD was more definitive in a news release issued in July of 2011, indicating that it had completed a exhaustive investigation and without a doubt, it is the conclusion of robbery homicide detectives that the sole perpetrator of this most heinous crime was Harold Martin Smith. With that, BHPD closed their case, declaring that they have no plans to ever reopen it. However, years later, previously unreleased pieces of the Beverly Hills Police Department's chase and murder file in investigation were reviewed, raising questions about the department's core findings and whether the, the department, which never was required to pre present evidence to, to a prosecutor, much less demonstrate it had identified the actual cul culprit beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury that they know how the murder was committed and whether multiple inv individuals were potentially involved. Independent documentarian Ryan Katzenbach, who sued BHPD for access to the Ronnie Chasen case file in 2013, lost his bid on a technicality, but to avoid further legal proceedings, a portion of the requested documentation was turned over in November of 2015. It numbered 120 semi-redacted pages, including witness reports, call records, and evidence logs. Katzenbach questions whether Bacay is a reliable narrator, noting, for example, that it would have been impossible for him to have seen, as Bacay claims, Chasen reported as murdered on the TV news immediately after he spoke with Smith, since she wouldn't be identified as the victim until long after the sun rose on November 16th. Still, the documentarian contends he doesn't necessarily believe Smith is innocent, it's just that he hasn't been suitably proven guilty. Katzenbach has created an elaborate chart of murky connections between Smith and Ronnie Chasen. And per The Hollywood Reporter, it's a circumstantial constellation of film ties, troubled relationships, criminal records, and money issues. All of it centers on one person long known to Ronnie. Several of her closest friends have suggested to The Hollywood Reporter that this person could have played a key role in a hit. Adding to doubts that Harold Smith was responsible for Ronnie Chasen's death is the fact that her autopsy report has been placed on a special indefinite hold. Police maintain that the hold is out of respect for her family. However, Craig Harvey with the coroner's office told the LA Times in 2013 that the coroner felt there is no legitimate reason remaining to maintain the security hold. Interestingly, a leaked coroner's report noted that hollow point bullets might have been used by the gunman, indicating that Ronnie's killer was an expert marksman and likely shot her from an SUV or a truck that pulled alongside her car. At the time of her death, Ronnie Chasen's estate was worth $6.1 million. Nearly all of it, taxes and after taxes and legal fees, excluding gifts to charities like the American Film Institute, Paul Newman's Hole in the Wall Gang, and Gilda Radner's Hereditary Cancer Program, went to her favored niece, Melissa Cohen, daughter of her older brother, Larry Cohen. Larry's other daughter was, in the words of Ronnie's will, quote, intentionally and with full knowledge of the consequences, end quote, only given $10. 
She was buried at Hillside Memorial Park, a Jewish cemetery in Culver City. Uh, this, it was filled with standing room only service and was attended by upward of a thousand people, including then Sony Pictures head Amy Pascal and astronaut Buzz Aldrin. A few months after Ronnie's death at the January 2011 Golden Globe Awards, Diane Warren won a globe for her song, You Haven't Seen the Last of Me, to which she dedicated to Ronnie from the stage. My sources for this story include Wikipedia Ronnie Chasen, The Hollywood Reporter, What Really Happened the Night of Hollywood Power Publicist Ronnie Chasen Was Killed by Gary Baum, November 16, 2016. The Hollywood Reporter, It's Past Time to Reopen the Ronnie Chasen Murder Investigation by Barry Gom, sorry, by Gary Baum, November 22, 2022, and DailyMail.com. Hollywood Mystery, The Burning Questions That Remain More Than 10 Years After the Murder of Powerhouse Publicist Ronnie Chasen by Ruth Bashinsky, May 13th, 2023. So, do you have any impressions? No. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, bye! <laughs> wrap it up, wrap yeah. it up. Okay, so um, I have always thought that Ronnie was murdered by someone who was jealous. There was a there was like a jealous thing going through it. I do not think she was murdered by a family member. I do think she was murdered by someone who was either embezzling money from her or was involved in some sort of financial malfeasance um, that also involved her. So you're reading about um, what's the gentleman's name who was um, who death by cop or died committed yeah. suicide? Her Harold Martin Smith. Martin, yeah, no, no. Um, convenient, convenient scapegoat. I think that it was a professional hit. I think someone hired an ex-military person um, to take her out. And he did. Um, so to, to sort of back up my feelings, um, I tuned in and pulled. Uh, so first card I pulled was the seeker. So we're looking for the truth, right? What's the truth? <laughs> Second card I pulled, <laughs> travel. <laughs> What's the truth for the travel, right? Third card I pulled murder right so so like yes there's no magic in the cards but it's sometimes really funny how they line up um like and i almost feel like they lined up this way because they knew i was going to give an on-air explanation so they got themselves in order you know um and i never like my shuffle system is just and then mash them together so anyway so this is just identifying what needs to be what the question that needs to be answered okay um then i pulled boop, um two of pentacles reversed whenever i see a car reversed it means it's out of balance or it's a negative and in this case it's a negative so pentacles for me almost always means money um and uh this card in particular is a woman making money right She's literally making, sewing money. So she's making money, right? So this was about, I think, someone stealing from her or stealing from someone she was involved in. And I kind of think it was sort of an embezzling thing from a budgetary standpoint at a major motion picture kind of thing, okay? Um, and I think she was onto it. And I hate to say it, but I almost feel like she was involved in it because there's a thread of that. There's a little bit of a thread of guilt to her. It's not much, but it's a little bit. So I absolutely don't want to disparage this woman if she, if she you know, is an upstanding citizen. I'm sure in kind of most areas she was, but there's a little, I can't dispel a little bit of that thread of guilt to her so something there was something there and then this card uh is the two of wands again i don't know what it is mean um but do you see how like 
it's all up in the air. It's all a wind, right? It's all like a mess, right? <clears throat> so this has me thinking of accounting. The accounting was, there was something iffy about the books. Someone was cooking the books. And this card, the high priest, the high priest for me is almost always about medical stuff. So um, whenever I see it, I know that it, or it literally triggers me to talk about someone's health. And then I'm digging into their energy and looking for hot spots and all of that stuff. So it's reversed. So her health. She, she actually was um, due in the next six months, right? As the year turned into 2011, she was due to have hip replacement surgery. And then so she was going to travel to Europe. Yeah, this that's not what that this is okay. meant to. Yeah, this means like she was murdered. She was killed. She oh, died. Sandy, shut yeah. up. Okay, never mind. No, 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 Sandy. No, it, because the, because you're Literal. saying stuff that other people. No, no, you're saying stuff that other people might assume or think. So it's good that you say it because then I can clarify and be like, by health, I mean she's dead. So um, and then. Um, I pulled the Wheel of Fortune. And in this instance, do you see how, so it goes from a baby to a young girl, to a teen girl, to, you know, like a mom, to a grandma, right? So the Wheel of Fortune has always for me meant karma, karma. So if it were reversed, I would say, okay, so this guy got away with it, but it's not. It's straight up. So I have a feeling karmically, I don't think that this person will ever be convicted. Whoever did orchestrate this, I don't think they'll ever be convicted of the crime, but I have a feeling that they got away once with murdering her and cooking the books and they are not going to get away with cooking the books the next time if they haven't already been caught in some way. So, um, so they'll be held responsible, just not for her murder. Um, so I think it was either another producer or an accountant. I don't think that there was organized crime involved. I don't think that it, this had anything to do with artwork. I don't think it had to do with anything other than someone was cooking the books. She knew about it and was benefiting in some way from it. And then she wasn't. And because she knew and could say stuff, she was taken out. Um, so why do you have a feeling for why the police department were, was so quick to try and close this case? I think the kind of money you're talking about is power. Okay. So someone had connections. Um, Ex-marksmen could have been military, could also have been police, ex-police. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to throw anything on the BHPD, like you guys into your job, blah, 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 blah. I think that they were presented with really flimsy evidence. They didn't, it just wasn't stuff. Mm. And there was so much pressure from the community, from the um, Hollywood community, solve this fucking crime because like, are, is Tom Hanks next? You know, like, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I think that they had to focus in on someone who looked like a reasonable choice. Here's a guy who is acting weird. There's an eyewitness that is saying he's saying this stuff. And then he conveniently, very conveniently to them, takes his own life in front of them. So they, there's not a lot of extra legwork they have to do to be like, we got him. Yeah. We caught him. Um, I think there might, might be an open FBI investigation into the guy who's cooking the books. And that's why the um, BHPD kind of backed off a little bit because they don't have enough evidence to, for conspiracy to commit murder. Right. But the FBI, I think, came forward and were like, listen, you know, mm. Mm -hmm. so that they could continue the investigation but i think that it this goes this guy is powerful and it goes deep so like i kept seeing as an example i kept seeing harvey weinstein you know how harvey weinstein was able 
really to commit heinous crimes for years and years and years and years because it was a very powerful figure. Mm -hmm. I feel like this guy is similarly powerful. Okay. I don't know that he's necessarily famous per se, but he feels powerful to me. So this so, is a guy who's head of the boardroom. So do you think that maybe Ronnie represented his interests as a client potentially, and that's how she was involved? So she I knew? don't think so. Okay. I think that she stumbled upon as a producer, right? She was a producer, correct? Public publicist. Oh, she was a publicist. Her Her brother was the producer. Okay. I think she stumbled upon someone cooking the books and because she's intimately involved. Yeah. In, she knew everybody. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think that she might have even discovered that the books were being cooked and said, cut me in or else. And they were like, mm. or okay. else. Okay. They gave her an or else. Got it. Yeah, I've always felt that money was at the root of it. But until you were speaking, until you like said the whole case and I could really focus my intuition on it, I hadn't really known how it came about. But now I can clearly see it was an accounting thing. She had a connection that was not good, not legal. And um, she was murdered likely because she either wanted more money or she was going you know, or she was making threats like well i'll expose you yeah. because as a publicist who knew everyone her word would have been accepted yes absolutely okay so it's not like she was an actress right like uh because no one believes women especially not actresses so um if she had, if she had not been as powerful as she was she'd still be alive but because she was known for her pushiness, for her, you know, brashness, so to speak. That's not someone you could ever trust to keep a secret. So. Well, it gave her power over this person and that wasn't Absolutely. acceptable. That was not acceptable. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Not to that guy. Yeah. Not to that guy. Cause he, he, I don't think he's been brought to justice at all, but I can feel on his energy. I can feel a little hint of the FBI. I can feel another ongoing crime being committed so he's cooking more books um and they're just trying to get enough evidence to bring him in but there isn't enough evidence because they don't even have the shooter they have no idea right there's just nothing linking him so he he's he's careful yeah he's very very careful and i think that the publicity that was brought from her murder i think that was like like, I think when he hired the guy to take her out, I think like it was going to be like a break in, you know, at her house, not in the middle of fucking yeah. Hollywood, you know, yeah. driving home. Right. But the guy saw an, an opportunity and obviously took it. So I don't think he's been I don't think that he's been hired for any other crimes. Yeah. I think that that murder was just too much exposure for the guy who's cooking the books. So I don't think he's ordered any other hits on anyone else because I think that he really pushed it with that one. And uh, he's become, I think, far more careful. Okay. Well, we'll stay tuned to see if the FBI ends up arresting anyone for something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cooking the books. Cooking the so, books. Yeah. Right. Awesome. So uh, did you want to share where more people can find information about you to book a reading and test out your talents as a... <laughs> Yeah, we talked a lot about intuition today, which is cool because we almost never talk about like how I, well, we do sometimes, but like in depth, um, how I work. So if you would like a reading, um, a, a personal reading, um, please get, head to victorialaurie.com and you can sign up for a reading there. You can sign up for my newsletter and you can also sign up for Patreon. My Patreon subscribers, I'm so sorry. I've been on vacation. I haven't paid attention to you, but there's a really good something about to be downloaded. So hang in there. There's some good stuff. Um, like the first chapter of a of the next cat or of the next um, MJ Ghost Hunter Mysteries. I'm gonna download that to Patreon. So if you want to read it and get a taste for where the story's going, subscribe to my Patreon page. Um, and um, that's all I got. Okay. <laughs> Quick and dirty. Boop, boop. <laughs> all right. Thank you everyone for your su suggestions. Oh, we, we, 
we really want to, um, we really want to, uh, we're thinking about doing some merch, um, and would love to know if you guys would like to see boop, ba -doo, on a t-shirt or a coffee mug or <laughs> something. Um, my little, what is it? My little, um, sound effect. Boop, ba -doo, doo. Um, yeah. can't wait to see that on a t-shirt. What? <laughs> right. Why not? What? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for your wonderful suggestions about the rich and famous. I have taken note. Uh, I just wanted to say that while we very much appreciate all your suggestions for the moment, Victoria and I are staying away from child related cases. Uh, it's just too difficult for both of us. Um, yeah, can't do it. So, so maybe in the future, but for right now, we're not necessarily going to pursue uh, child related cases. They're just far too disturbing. Yeah. So we did the really upsetting one for me was, um, Asia. Um, and the really upsetting one for you was yogurt shop murders. I just, yeah. And those were almost back to back. And, um, like I was, I was devastated for a week after Asia, you were devastated for a, a good portion after the yogurt shop murders. And we both made an agreement, like, that makes us not want to do this. Touching that energy, looking at, at such cruelty to children makes us not want to do this. So we understand that children go missing and you want to know what happened to them and if they were, uh, if harm came to them, who did it. It's just not something that we can handle. So I, Sam said, you know, maybe in the future, I don't see it. I don't want to touch that. I just don't. So probably not. So, I, and you guys are wonderful about sending us suggestions, but please know that that is, that is devastating to tune into. And I never want to be like hijacked by what I felt for Asia again, ever, yeah. ever. Yeah. So. so anyway, uh, any suggestions that y'all have for rich and famous? I'm currently researching, appreciate the suggestions that y'all have offered. Some of them are very interesting that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of myself. So Thank you. Keep them coming. If you enjoyed today's show or any of our shows, please subscribe, like, review, send us applause. I don't care what it is. Just um, we very much appreciate your time and attention and uh, enjoy it. And your comments. And, and your, your comments. comments. Thank you for comments. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. And until next time, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, we'll, we'll see you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. See you guys. Okay. Bye. Bye.